The ASEAN Soji Caucus, or ASC, is a network of human rights activists from Southeast Asia. The ASC enhances the capacity and knowledge of human rights defenders in promoting and protecting the rights of persons of diverse Soji SC in the Southeast Asian region. This is the series of discussions on queering alternative regionalism that is organized by ASEAN Soji Caucus with the support of VOICE. This series aims to spark a conversation among LGBTQI organizations on how to challenge the dominant discourse among ASEAN governments that excludes and delegitimizes the existence and narratives of LGBTIQ people, including the use of culture, art, and memory as tools and sites of resistance. In this episode, Ang Yi Sheng takes a critical look at the development of queer literature and art in Singapore and how these may influence the flowering of local activism. Ang Yi Sheng is a multidisciplinary writer, researcher, and LGBT activist from Singapore. He has explored queer themes in literature and published works such as the non-fiction book of coming out stories entitled SQ21 Singapore Queers in the 21st Century, the poetry collection Last Boy that won the Singapore Literature Prize, and Lion City, which won the Singapore Book Awards. I've made several projects trying to map the rise of queer art in Singapore and looking at you know what happens in literature across different languages, in especially theatre. And my sense is that uh, the reason why suddenly in the late 80s, a lot of people in Singapore start to write about LGBT issues, they start to, to stage plays about LGBT issues, stems from two major things. Okay, one, it's in the 80s that we st- that Singapore is actually doing really, really quite well for itself financially. Singapore is on the brink of becoming first world. And so we've got this strong Generation X middle class that's emerged, rather educated. And second, it's in the 80s that we have HIV um, taking over in Southeast Asia and the rest of the region. Singapore gets its first diagnoses in 1985. And my, my sense is that the fact that in this very developed, prosperous country like Singapore, we get this sudden discovery that middle-class Singaporeans are in danger of dying from this incurable disease. The fact that this is the first time we've got an epidemic um, that no one really knows how to cure in the age of penicillin it really freaks people out. It leads the government to do like uh, crackdowns against gay clubs. It creates a moral panic. And so well, queers are feeling de- being oppressed partly because of HIV and partly because of the government's response to HIV. And because of that, queer people start creating art, which is very openly ex- uh, expressive, talk- sometimes talking about HIV, sometimes just talking about their relationships, putting their face to it. And often it's about transgender people as well. It's not just gay people who's, who are writing about it. it, it uh, it's uh, gay men, it, it's also lesbians putting a face to this. And it reaches a point that like between 1992 and 1995, I've counted like at least 17 queer plays which were put up in multiple languages and like lots of works of literature written. And this is by queer and straight people. There's this focus on the idea of queerness it becomes um, a way to talk about how Singapore, this rather successful country, is not successful for everyone. It's fail- failing a significant proportion of people. And because there is so much queer-themed cultural production that's happening, and partly because the government is trying to censor a lot of it, this means that today, when Singaporeans try and look at the history of Singaporean literature, theatre or art, they almost inevitably have to encounter queer works. So we end up at the center of the narrative. What's also quite interesting is the fact that if we really want to prosper, we can no longer just depend on being a hub for manufacturing and trade. We've got to become a creative city. They called it the Renaissance city, this idea that we have to become a city which is going to be a hotspot for new, for new industries like, like IT, like entrepreneurship. And one way to encourage that is to fund the arts. And another way to encourage that, according to reports uh, live by Richard Florida's on the rise of the creative class, is to be more open to queer sexuality, to allow for a queer cultural scene. And so, although there continues to be loads of um, censorship, I've seen over the past uh, 20 years of my career, 
a gradual easing and normalization of queer themes in various uh, as arts media. And also an increasing sense of pride in Singapore arts, which is why so many young people are trying to look at that history and trying to reclaim that and seeing that there are all these queer works. Is this kind of flowering and development of uh, queer culture? This sounds like a big story of triumph. And yet what I realized, this whole story about parent queer success, it's really a story about bourgeois values. The reason why queer Singaporeans wanted to speak up in the 80s is because we had a whole class of mostly gay men, also gay women, who were educated, quite bourgeois, and felt like, why am I not getting the same fair deal as my straight friends? And th that's why they were speaking up. Because of their class, they were able to write plays, to direct plays, to write books and express themselves. And also because the government wanted the entire country to have bourgeois values that they decided, you know what, it's worth embracing queer culture in order for everyone to become metrosexuals, as it were. And what gets left behind in all this is the sense of intersectionality, the feeling that queer liberation should be deeply tied to class liberation, to the eradication of poverty to the fact that, you know, queer people deserve rights because we're human, not because we've earned it. Transgender people, especially transgender sex workers, also have, get left behind. And yet another way you can be bourgeois these days is to adopt a bourgeois style of religion, to subscribe to a prosperity gospel, to prescribe to very Saudi-influenced Islam. And so we still get continued resistance for any kind of queer affirmative legislation from people, including very high up government ministers who have adopted these religions. And on the other hand, one reason why Singapore has actually been able to attain a certain level of comfort with queer culture is that we do not have an official religion. So there is still this feeling that, okay, this is secular space. They can't use this appeal towards religious tradition to clamp down on queer people. But it always feels unstable. When I think about what can happen in 20 years' time, I always wonder. The fact that an increasing number of people are becoming interested in the arts and therefore becoming more accepting of queer people. Will this flowering of queer culture, is this going to be crushed in the same way? This podcast is released under a Creative Commons license.